I know it's kind of a groaner, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Do they have a 4th of July in England? Absolutely. Comes right after July 3rd. Of course, uh, their celebration isn't anything like our uh, July 4th uh, independence celebration from England at all. And there's just a certain national pride that fills our hearts as we sing God Bless America. Or maybe something more contemporary like from Hamilton the musical. You know, after all, we, we didn't throw away our shot. We're young, scrappy, and hungry, and immigrants who got the job done. Yeah, we got it done all right. We're now the sole superpower on the earth. Yes. Now, not long after our July 4th celebration and declaration in 1776, there was the great seal of America that was struck. And that was in 1782. If you have a dollar bill in your pocket or purse, you'll notice that it adorns the back side of your bill. Now, there's some very curious things written on this seal. They're written in Latin, so you don't immediately know what it's saying. But if you were to zero in on the pyramid side, you'll see next to the all-seeing eye of providence, or God, a Latin phrase that translates something like, God has favored our undertaking." And for those of you that know Latin, you know, wait a minute, God's not in that. It's, it's assumed. A more literal translation is the nod of approval. Oh, yeah. Now, there's another Latin phrase underneath the uh, pyramid, and it is the new order of the ages. So every time you pull out a dollar bill and you slap it down to buy something, you're making a declaration of your own to the world, saying to everyone, hey, God's on our side, and we're remaking the history of the world into American history. Yeah. And, and this kind of thinking really pervades our culture. And, and it's not something that you, you really consciously think about, but it's more of just underneath that, yeah, we're special. You know, God's got his eye on us and thumbs up to us. And, and yes, we, we do have a special place in the world. Now, I don't know if you realize this when we were reading the chapter, the portion of a chapter from Jeremiah, but it also had a, a national pride, God's on our side vibe to it. Now, if you didn't get that, I understand, because it was such a tiny little snippet of a very long discourse uh, in which, you know, lots more was there. And so I, I kind of want to fill in some of the gaps. And there in Jerusalem, the, the time frame would have been about 500 or so years before the birth of Jesus, when this part of Jeremiah was written. And it, it was there that the, the Jewish nation of people, along with their capital city of Jerusalem and their precious temple in the center, they just had a sense that they were God's favor because he said as much and that the entire history of the world and its blessing depended upon this particular race of people in such a way that nothing and I mean nothing was ever going to happen to their country oh enemies may come but they will go and they will prevail that was in their national dialogue and in their brains of who they were and, and what they could do in the world. Unfortunately, some pretty big uh, enemies were coming down on them, and that was the Babylonians. And they had already taken all of the gold and the furnishings out of the temple. You know, imagine being in a church with no chairs, okay? I and mean, that's no organ. There's nothing there, and all the treasury's gone, and... And, and their king was taken, and, and lots of leaders were gone. And, and here's the prophet Hananiah trying to calm people down and reassure them, it's okay. We are one nation under God. We will not fall. And he's, he's given this as a, as a prophet saying, God has told me so much. 
Well, you know who's listening to all this is Jeremiah. And I can imagine his response to be something of a tongue-in-cheek, slow clap saying, Amen, brother. Amen. May the Lord do so. May the Lord fulfill everything that you have prophesied. But I have received a different word from God, and I too am a prophet. And we will soon see who the true prophet is by what actually happens. History proved that Jeremiah was the truth teller because the Babylonians did come in and they destroyed the temple and they t exiled all of the people and they turned the city into a pile of rubble. So nations of the earth take notes. And even citizens of our own fair and beautiful land, there are no human beings who forge a new order for the ages. There are no people who have the nod of God's approval in and of themselves. Even Israel even their capital city of Jerusalem, even their own temple did not stand. There's only one story to tell yourself. There's only one guiding story that will lead to life. And that is a life that is taken up into the life of God Himself, personally and individually, where God becomes then your life, your love, and your pursuit of happiness. It is only in His new forming of an age and order for the age in which your history is secure. Your place in this world is ultimately safe. And that is with God Himself and His King that He has established in His Son, Jesus. Well, all of this is a shot across our bow of personal independence. We would much rather have a God who simply nods his approval on our plans, our dreams, and our wants. We would much rather have the all-seeing eye of providence favoring how we have ordered our lives, no matter how godless, immoral, hate-filled or greedy. But it is Jesus who comes to us as the truth teller. And he reminds us that God has a sole claim upon your life and your allegiance. And to really draw this fine distinction and line so that everyone understands exactly the allegiance he's talking about, he says, to our most personal and intimate relationships. If you love your mother or your father more than me, you are not worthy of me. If you love your son or your daughter more than me, you are not worthy of me. If you have made your life and found your life in something other than God, you will in the end lose it all in the pile of rubble that is to come. This is the sword that Jesus has come to bring upon the earth. And it strikes at the core of every human heart. And it cuts into us and goes after, well, who is governing your life? Who is it that constitutes your decisions and legislates your behaviors? Who is it that ultimately has your patriotism, and your heart. But why a sword, Jesus? Why, why the demand for such allegiance? Why the division of households, of father and mother and in-laws? You know, we, we really find ourselves chafing under uh, the lack and the loss of our freedoms. We really don't like being told what to do at all. But before you go all Boston Tea Party, keep in mind that the sovereign 
God of the universe does not impose his reign and rule on your life. He allows anyone to declare their independence from him. You see, his sword is not to put down the rebellious or the rebellion. His sword is a question of governance. Who is it and what is it that's running your life? Whose nod of approval are you looking to? And whose order of life for this age are you living? And when you really stop to consider how you've answered these questions, there then is the division of death and life that Jesus is talking about that comes from a sword. For as you see the life that you've made, God will allow you to have a life as prosperous and money-driven as you want. He'll let you have your family be the ultimate. He will even allow you to be church-going people. But if He is not the one who's the ultimate love, then while you've had this life and you've found a wonderful life here in this country, at your death it all dissolves and is taken away. You see, it, it's only in Jesus. And he's not come to invade our borders. He's come to tell us the truth and then to give us life. He is the truth teller so that we might truly examine what and who and there in him to actually find life. And we know that it is a true life that cannot be taken because history has borne out its witness in his death on the cross and his resurrection. He lives and so shall we. We find then that the life that he gives, we truly can love our father and our mother, our children and our in-laws, but it is first and foremost a love that has been received by God and is returned to Him. And then from this relationship, now we can finally truly love our families. We find in Jesus that we truly may have a very prosperous life financially with all kinds of talents and abilities, hobbies and interests that we've really pursued. But we found that in each one of these pursuits that they all are servants to the order of the age that God has established and that they are all in service to our neighbor, that we will the good of our neighbor through our jobs, through our money, through our interests and hobbies. And so we find then in Jesus a life that cannot be taken. And so the, the sermon take home for today isn't a card but a question as we consider our allegiances and who we have given that to. And you look at all of life. Well, Jesus, you know, I, I pledge my allegiance to you. What does that mean for my home? Who I let in and who I am hospitable to? What about my family and the ties and demands and what I give to them? And what does it mean if, if Jesus is my sole allegiance at work? We spend most of our lives at work. So what does it mean that Jesus, you're the sole allegiance? And so this is a question then to be in dialogue with Jesus throughout this week and to allow the one who has given you a life that cannot be taken and that in him there is this constant supply of his grace and his forgiveness and a leading into this eternal life. May the Lord bless you then as you consider your allegiance to Jesus. Amen.